Hey, good evening, everybody. This is uh, Joe Driscoll back again with uh, the podcast Salt City Grind. We're here on episode four. Uh, we had a great episode on Tuesday with Alamin Mohammed. was amazing. And tonight I'm joined by my friend Jared Shepard. How you doing, Jared? Doing very well. Thank you. Great. Um, in our conversations, you know, I, I know we're both friends. We're both fans of the uh, Sam Harris podcast. And uh, all of our conversations have been uh, so much fun for me and fluent that I, I always feel like you could be like a Paul Bloom type uh, recurring recurring character <laughs> if this if the podcast lasts more than the shutdown, if we keep it going. Uh, sure. You're definitely someone I enjoy talking to. So because um, we share, you know, we share not only an interest in politics and economics and the best way to structure society um, and those kinds of uh, big ticket issues, but more importantly, we're both musicians. Yes. Um, so, you know, I I, we both yeah. got our music stuff. I got Bach over here and <laughs> I, you got someone over your shoulder too. So. Yeah. I've got, I've got, you know, a little, a little embarrassing. I got my own posters up over there, you know, <laughs> celebrating myself in the background, but it's my basement. It's the fitting room for this. So, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I loved I loved uh, checking your music as well. So you're actually you know a really uh, accomplished pianist as well. So people can check Jared out uh, and his music as well. But for the folks that are just joining us, why don't you tell everyone about your background, uh, your experiences, and and you know um, what path you've led up until this point in your life? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I've uh, I how long do you have to be in Syracuse to to um, well, you're, you're never on the native ground if you have, weren't born here, but I've been in Syracuse for, um, I think over 12 years, uh, just about. So I think that gets me first tier, or maybe second tier or something like that. Um, so I came out here and uh, was was working, doing most of my work as a, as a musician, as a, uh, a choir director, an organist um, in East Syracuse. And that, that was actually my first experience Exposure, I think, to doing some level of community work because, um, as you know, um, music is community level work, and we were um, uh, we had a program that was like really focused on uh, Gregorian chant and sort of stuff that no one was doing over there. And I really wanted to get more people involved, and we had a little uh, recital area where I found a piano for like six hundred dollars, and uh, we were giving concerts over there, and and I was. Um, it, it was a real challenge because I, I I could never figure out how to get traction. You know, of course we're over in East, East Syracuse, which has a, a pretty high uh, poverty rate, and and I'm trying to do these like, you know, probably pretty pretentious looking um, art song recitals, and um, <laughs> but it, but it started to get me exposed to what was going on in that community and how could we be a part of it, and, and I think more importantly finding out how to not be a part of it. Like what, what, do you, what, are, what are the missed opportunities? Um, and uh, that was also right around the time that the Syracuse Symphony um, uh, folded. So I was in a, uh, I was looking at the community through that lens, but just starting to get exposed to the community. And, and um, I had a lot of conversations with my wife about like, you know, all right, let's, let's pack up, let's get out of here. Um, and then, and then I, I was just talking about, to you about this, Joe. I think I was a, maybe a bit of a rock thrower uh, at first. <laughs> I, I, this we, we got to get out of here. And um, my wife told me, uh, you know, why don't you um, why don't you work on making it better? You know, why don't you do that approach? And I was, I think what I might think is is probably like like a lot of people, or maybe too many people. I figured um, from a very cynical point of view. Um, what's to change? There's some politicians and they're a political class and they're just connected. And then there's uh, other public servants who, who just sort of punch the clock and, and there's no reason to tamper with that or get involved. I have my own interests. Um, but then skipping past a whole bunch, I, I was uh, back at Syracuse University um, doing some work in musicology and an opportunity to go to Maxwell came up which was really un, un, uh, anticipated, and walked over there and um, about a week or two before their program began. And it's a one year master's program. And uh, had to stop be, I had to stop being a rock thrower. I had to pick up a shovel. Nice, there you go. <laughs> so at least they tell you you have to do that. I wasn't believing 
It took me a few. <laughs> it took me a few classes before they made me a believer. Nice. So, um, where where did this path take you? So, what, you studied at Maxwell, and then where did you go from there? Uh, so, so I, I yeah, at Maxwell, I worked right away um, on a couple of uh, consulting projects, um, research uh, on the research end of a, a few consulting projects through the Center for Policy Research at Maxwell. Um, and, and we looked at local government um, and looked at, uh, you know, really down to the, the budgeting uh, level of services and, and trying to find cost savings by combining services and going in, going into small governments and talking with uh, the people working there and, and learning about what they were doing. Uh, and that, that was that was pretty good, good experience um, right out of the gate. Uh, at Maxwell, I, I was most interested in um, uh, actually tax policy, uh, which is which is fascinating stuff. Honestly, um, I, I swear it's interesting and um, uh, and economic development. So uh, then a position opened up at uh, Center State, which does a tremendous amount of work in our region and they're full of really smart people who are dedicated. And it felt a lot like it actually felt a lot like being at Maxwell, which is not uh, surprising because there's a lot of uh, MPAs uh, either working there or within this, you know, the, the sphere of work. I'm, I'm very frequently working with people that that uh, that went to Maxwell. Yeah. So what is, give us like, you know, a uh, quick, you know, cliff notes in, in just a sentence or two, what does center state CEO do and what do you do at center state CEO? So the, um, just, in, you know, very broadly, they're um, economic development organization. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that we do that are, that are consistent with what you see regional chambers doing. Um, I think more more importantly, though, is is the tremendous amount of work and investment that they make in um, uh, in economic inclusion and in community development, and and really making sure that the work is is going to be broadly um, beneficial to to the population. So um, my work there really revolves around uh, meeting whatever our research needs are. Um, for our members or for our own initiatives and um, working with to help inform the community um, as a source for economic data, um, research on policies that are going to be important to our region um, and really doing whatever we can to, to not only monitor what's going on, but prepare for uh, changes that, that we expect to see. Yeah. So what is, um, you know, I, you and I have talked offline about this a little bit. What are you, um, you know, I know you guys have done some uh, surveys and some outreach in, in the Syracuse business community throughout this crisis, throughout the COVID situation. Um, what are you hearing? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? Um, what broad strokes has, has the data revealed thus far about uh, how Syracuse is, is uh, adapting and dealing with, with the crisis? I think it's, it, it's so far been very consistent with, with what, you, we read about it at the national level um, that consumer facing industries um, have the most trouble, which obviously is really expected because if, if you don't have uh, consumers because of a, of a needed, you know, suppression for health reasons, um, you have, you have more troubles. Um, that's been consistent the, the um, I think some of, some of the, the best, the, the uh, uh, the highlights that sort of come out, or, or the points of points of light that come out of it for Syracuse, is that uh, we have a lot of industries that that are are a little better insulated um, from this. So maybe maybe right early on that regions with a, a tremendous amount of tourism and, and hospitality um, w really would get would get hard, and and that's been that's been true. Um, so we've avoided some of that. And what are, um, what are the uh, what are the more insulated industries in Syracuse? Like what what, what you know, as opposed to tourism or something, what are the kind of the more resilient things that are going on in Syracuse, Nanadaga that that are, are more hardy in this kind of climate? Is education, um, you know, obviously, and, and no one's untouched by this. So that's the other challenge when you're talking about this is you'll say like, well, these industries are doing a little better, but they're all getting the, the everyone's on the receiving end of the largest economic shock um, in a, in a generation or, or more. So with that sort of in mind, um, you know, that everyone's being affected. It, it, education has had different, our education service industries had different concerns, but, 
um, a little bit um, less of a like a consumer based shock. Um, our healthcare industry is is uh, also has challenges because they had to go through so many shutdowns. Yeah. Um, but but there's but but there's still a lot of demand there. Um, so and and that will be that will persist. And, and our highest employment areas in the region are in uh, education and healthcare, mm. and then manufacturing and and uh, uh, service industries like food service industries are. Re I'm sorry, manufacturing and retail are a little bit lower, but they're fairly consistent. And, and manufacturing so far um, has has done pretty well uh, through the crisis comparatively. Again, they've been hit with the with the biggest shock that they've. Yeah, that we've all had. So what yeah. in your in your just um, you know. And obviously, I know that you know this is uh, obviously a, a multi-billion-dollar, perhaps trillion-dollar question that everybody's grappling with. So, um, but what would be your thoughts as far as you know? I shared an article the other day from Mark Cuban suggesting that um, more of the stimulus money and all the money that's coming in should be given to uh, people on the fringes that are economically insecure, that are struggling, so that that money gets spent and it it sparks uh, economic activity. Whereas you know. When it goes to the higher up in the food chain, you know, it, it can go to buybacks, stock buybacks and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, so that was one thing. But what would you think um, from your analysis that, you know, how could local governments respond? How could how could state or federal governments respond to this massive economic shock that's happening? And what could we as as, you know, local obviously local politicians, we don't have ability to regulate the Fed or, or you know, control national federal banks or anything like that. But. Um, what are some thoughts about, um, you know, what you're seeing and what you think that we could do on, on local levels? Yeah. Um, well, I think for starters, what the city of Syracuse did was, was tremendous. Um, they, they came out very quickly with, uh, with capital support in, in the form of, of loans. And, and I'm sure that those loans were, um, uh, spoke, uh, uh, spoken for pretty quickly, and um, other other local business leadership has also been tremendous. Um, funds coming um, through a number of organizations, in, including ours, to to make uh, grants and loans available. Um, so th those those are tr tremendous responses that I wouldn't I wouldn't know because I haven't asked everywhere. But I'm but I'm sure not every community in the United States um, was able to respond that way. Um, and as far as the larger macro stuff goes, and and you know, I, I I'm not gonna, I, I would love I, I would love to um, I'd love to play armchair uh, macro economist, but, but it's just not. I don't have those. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't have those letters after my name. Um, yeah, and I don't know if I'll get them. But uh, right. <laughs> the, the the big the, I th I think just speaking in really broad strokes, we we understand over the last few years. I I think there's a, there's a fairly well agreed upon understanding that that um, well, it's not understanding. It's just in the data that inequality is is at its highest level uh, that that we've really seen, um, and and there's inefficiencies that are associated with that. And then it's also uh, challenging for pe for people who are not sharing in 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 economic growth. This and and maybe this gets to what you were saying. Mark Cuban was talking about. Just anticipate more challenges associated with inequality. I mean, everything that we were that we had to address before, when it came to um, uh, income inequality and poverty and, and um, inequality, uh, th this this is this is going to make that even more challenging. So be prepared to continue these these investments and these programs um, that that we've begun um, because they're going to be needed even more now. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think about, um, you know, the, um, the, the one of the first, you're the first person to bring to my attention that when we talk about wealth inequality and we talk about uh, COVID and, and the crisis, um, it seems that the stock market has been fairly resilient while we've seen, you know, the largest, uh, you know, rise in unemployment, you know, unemployment systems are flooded uh, throughout the country. Um, but it seems the stock market has been doing well. What are your thoughts about the disconnect there? And, you know, what is that disconnect? And, and you know, I don't know. Do you have any comments or any, any thoughts about 
why the stock market seems to be uh, currently. Uh, I don't even know what happened today. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what happened today, yeah. but you know, you and I have had that conversation over the last few weeks that it seems that there seems to be a major disconnect here between the two. Yeah. Well, I, I don't get paid to follow equities, equity markets, and and I found out why over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and I was trying to do it in my spare time. Um, yeah. I have a co- I have a friend who who works uh, uh, at a really at a really sophisticated level doing analysis uh, on um, equity funds. And so I'll, I'll I'll dial him up with my massive confusion, and he'll say some things that make a lot of sense um, at the time. Um, but that that disconnect, I, I guess one thing I, I could comment on is that just from some stuff that I've read and some studies, that the equities markets and the economy aren't aren't exactly attached. They they obviously it makes a lot of sense if they move in the same direction. Um, but the amount that those equities markets and the actual growth of the economy um, are attached, if you imagine sort of like uh, two lines moving and, and going up together, and this is equities and these are going up faster, um, that detachment has been growing over the last uh, couple of years um, at, at rates that are, um, I, I think, some of the highest in, in history. And do so, we know, so that, do we, yeah. Do we know what? accounts for that why is you know why are we seeing um you know this this greater gap this greater disconnection between what's going on with the working folks to what's going on in the stock market so i i think some of that's kind of a false dichotomy always to, to, i mean keep keep in mind also that like what's in the stock market also accounts for a lot of uh 401ks and retirement plans and and things that are fairly modest, you know, if you like considered that, you know, versus like giant hedge fund owners or something. Um, so, so there, there, it is connected to, a, to, to sort of what people are working for and saving and investing in. Um, but I don't know what the exact number is. One clue could be that, you know, if you looked at what percentage of the population actually owns stocks in, in terms of like their income, I'm sure I've seen a chart recently where, you know, it's it's pretty concentrated in like the upper 10 percent, at least probably even even more concentrated, where you know, like the upper 5 percent of the income distribution in this country owns, you know, the majority of the stocks, 90 percent of the stocks or something like that. Yeah. So so it, it, it's probably it's more ref- it, it it's more consistent with with the inequality and, and the rising incomes at the top than than with a broad economic growth, which since the last 20, 30 years has been pretty close to two to 3% GDP growth annually. Yeah. Well, so tell us about what you think of, um, you know, the, the Syracuse economy pre COVID pre the crisis. Um, yeah. how, how do you think, you know, up until this point, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about inequality, um, who the economy is working for, uh, those kind. you know, it's, it's very important when we say how the economy is doing, uh, what we're defining economy as and, and who, you know, who is being affected. So um, I guess, you know, maybe give us some broad stroke stat analysis about where Syracuse's economy was before all this. And, um, you know, it, it, do you feel there's reason for optimism, um, you know, before this crisis and, and after the crisis, I guess, as well? Yeah, the big, I would say one of the biggest things that I off the top of my head and, and, and that I remember spending a lot of time talking about last year is job growth in Syracuse. It was, it last year was really um, a, a, ter- a terrific year. I have a graph. I have a data visualization. Can you show it? Yeah. Yeah. I'll pull it up now. It's almost like I was ready for that question. All right. So this was, this was a, uh, a really exciting um, thing that we watched all all of last year. Um, we saw in, in in we saw in the early part of the year that we had a job growth that was um, in excess of what was happening in New York State. And percentage wise, if we looked at all of the other metros, um, quite a bit quite a bit more advanced. So we we were really um, starting to thunder when it came to uh, adding jobs. And it was great in April, and then we watched it. And then by the time we got to the end of the year, uh, we were able to see that it, that we we um, 
stuck with it. And, and you can see that in, in these three charts. Um, so, so what are the metrics yeah. here? So the first one's Syracuse, second one's New York State, and the third one. And, and what have you measured here? So this is, uh, th this is uh, t total job growth year over year. So okay. compared to that month in the previous year. So this would be uh, 2019 uh, compared to 2018. Um, and then and then expressed in terms of a uh, percentage growth. So if I take if I take all of New York State and we see what percentage of job growth we had over the year, that's what the middle chart looks like. Um, then if I take Albany, Buffalo, and Rochester and add up all of their jobs and compare that to the previous year, we can see what their job growth looked like. And okay. then if you look at Syracuse, you can see that month after month when we were looking at jobs reports um, that New York State was putting out. Um, Syracuse was always in the top uh, one or two for percentage job growth, and and um, it stayed that way all year. That was really great. Awesome. And and not a, and not a uh, an accident either. There, uh, Syracuse is the 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 leadership in Syracuse is, um, and I've really just shown up pretty recently um, to to doing this work. I mean, they were doing this work and doing this data driven stuff. Um, you know, before I took a quantitative class uh i was playing the pipe organ um which is great um but those investments in in industries that are that are uh going to drive the economy that are export industries um are you know had been working and, and really started to show so um minus this uh really major shock that we're all dealing with um we are expecting to, to, to watch this uh, continue to grow because more jobs were coming, more industries were, were developed. Um, as we know, Syracuse Surge, all of the downtown investments were, were really paying off. So it's um, very exciting and an exciting thing, I think, to look forward to getting back to. And what were some of those, um, you know, if you can name just a few of those big, you know, when we see that bump, um, and I guess this goes back to our question as well about, you um, equity and growth or, you know, how growth comes, what are some of those? So when we see Syracuse, you know, it, it looks massively like it's outperforming Buffalo and Rochester uh, as far as job growth. Do we know, are, are there a few big uh, contributors that we can name easily that are, um, you know, that we can factor in that are, are attributing, you know, that we can attribute that growth to? I, I didn't see any, any one, there were a couple of upcoming announcements, especially towards the end of the year. I know we were um, we're looking forward to uh, JMA Wireless had a lot of jobs they were announcing, and um, Bankers Health Group, um, and those those were were significant jobs. There weren't any specific though, you know, like one big announcement kind of jobs that's coming. Um, but this was this was just a pattern of of growth, um, and it was also a matter of. Um, uh, a little bit of matter of, of of kind of catching up at at the at the end of um, a, a really long expansion cycle in the economy. Um, so we were seeing it in a lot of places, um, month to month. I, th I think we could see that it might concentrate in. Um, uh, we had some good jo job growth in transportation and warehousing, so we're seeing that develop. Um, what particularly does that mean, job in transportation? Uh, so. Uh, just that, that that the industry that would involve um, uh, distribution centers or warehousing or trucks that are um, moving, uh, you know, goods uh, through, you know, out of our region. Okay. Well, so let's, if we can, and tell me if I, if I ever hit a topic that's not, um, you know, we're just kind of um, freestyling here a bit. I didn't really prep you too much with the questions. So if there's something that's that's um, you'd rather not discuss, we can just move on. But um, we talked about you know you being a data analyst and you know and research and and studying all this stuff, um, using different indicators to show um, who the economy is working for, how it's growing. Um, how's that pursuit going, and, and what are you thinking of as as ways to think outside of the box? And you know what are the traditional indicators when we show you know, economic growth and what are you looking at to try to see, um, you know, as we said with the stock market, you can look to the stock market and, and while 30 million people are losing their job, you, you're seeing economic growth. So what does economic growth mean? 
uh, in that, you know, in that phrase. And, and what do you think that, um, you know, we can look at differently? What were we looking at before to analyze Syracuse growth? And what could we look at to make sure that we're looking at growth and equity at the same time? Um, yeah, th those are really, really difficult questions. Um, and the, 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 the best thing I can say about it off the top is uh, that the work that we're doing is, and the people that I work with are hugely supportive of, of uncovering those things, of, of overturning those, those stones and looking um, as hard as we can. Um, we, so the, the, the traditional measurements that, that, that convey what's going on in a community is, you know, job numbers, as we were just talking about, um, wages, uh, rising, um, median wages, uh, home prices. Um, you can look at the actual productivity and the output of a region. So those are the things where you all sort of just look for them to go up and say things are getting better because these numbers are going up. And, and, that's, and that's generally true. Um, but, it's, but for inclusivity, um, those don't describe as well. Um, it, if I tell you that the median salary went up, that doesn't tell you very much about um, people who are earning in, in the in the you know maybe the lowest 25 percent um so we the brookings institute does something called the metro monitor and they put that out every year and it's a scorecard that looks at inclusive growth measures where they consider um measurements of uh of of poverty they consider um racial wealth gaps um they consider uh racial poverty gaps um, and they look at the uh, lower quintiles of, of income to see if those are those are moving as well. So those are a few indicators that they use, and they do it for all. Uh, I think they do it for um, 100 metro areas in the country, so you, so you can compare um, to, to other metros how you're doing. Um, but it, within our own work, this is something that is a major, is a big part of my role working with our economic inclusion team. And we want to understand that better. So um, I'm actually right now working with um, a capstone team, which is a project that you do at the end of your MPA at Maxwell. And um, so we've been working, this is our first week together on this. And I've asked them to, uh, to go out and survey all of the research on um, creating indicators that are more attached to the realities of, of, of lives improving, of, of inclusive economic growth. Um, and look at the cities that have done this already. So Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, in Orla Orlando and Northeast Ohio are all great examples of places that conveyed a large number of stakeholders to say, what, what should we really be measuring you know, when we talk about growth? And they come up with, with pretty compelling answers. What were, um, can yeah. you name a few of those answers off the top of your head? What were some of the, what were some of the, I think you, you, you know, you may have touched on a few of them, but you know, what are the core um, or particularly what are the more interesting um, different ways of looking at economic indicators that, you know, you said the, the, the disparate, the um, difference between looking at the median income versus the lowest quarter of, of income earners. Uh, that's obviously one, you know, obvious one. Are there other ones that are, uh, kind of more innovative that that have, have interest you? Yeah, I, I think I think that um, including public health into the discussion, and obviously right now uh, that's becoming really obvious. Yeah. Uh, the role that public health plays in an economy, and vice versa, um, that seems to be really important. Um, how, how would one yeah. measure that? How would how would the groups? How would different cities measure, you know, health outcomes for for different communities? Uh, you you would find like in certain parts of a city, um, you know, rates of uh, asthma or rates of chronic illness or rates of um, uh, rheumatological disease um, that maybe are, are consistent with a neighborhood or um, an income level, and 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 determine if those things are changing as you know as the economic conditions improve. Um, to, to keep track of, of how those things are working together. Right. And, and I think another indicator that, that would be, that's really interesting is also representation. Um, 
in uh, in government. That that actually came up in the uh, I think the Rockefeller Institute did did a lot of work on these things. And and one interesting thing to look at, and this is a great thing we can look at in Central New York because um, we have a lot of elected officials. Um, is what is the representation uh, in terms of gender, and what is the representation in terms of in terms of race? Um, and and I don't I haven't done that analysis. Um, it's it's probably not unlikely that somebody has, uh, but that would be a good way also of understanding um, not just uh, economic, but political power. Mm. Yeah, anecdotally, I mean, I, I think about that a lot and look at that. Um, you know, this is the first time in, in at least for the city government, for uh, Syracuse Common Council that we've had, um, you know, a greater or equal number of people of color um, on the council, uh, you know, we've got, uh, 10 people in total and, and five of them are people of color. Um, so that's, you know, that's a historic landmark. Um, you know, Pamela Hunter, we, we had her on the first episode of the show, you know, as the first African American, uh, assembly woman and, you know, with Rachel May, um, taking the state Senate seat, you know, we only have, you know, what, four state reps for this area. And, to have, uh, you know, two of them, um, you know, have, have 50% female, I think is, is showing a lot of progress by, uh, by no means do I think it's, you know, it's a closed book and we've, we've succeeded, but, you know, I think we still have a lot, a long way to go on everything we're doing, but, um, yeah, but, you know, some anecdotal, um, interesting, you know, interesting, um, changes and growth that have happened just in the last, you know, two to three years or something like that, you know, um, but yeah, so what is what do you think that so as measuring that as an indicator, um, how how do you think that factors in? So that just shows you know more um, political power among different groups. Is that is that is that the only thing that indicates of, or does that show a healthier economic like ecosystem per se? I would I would think that they, that they that they would have a lot in common. I I don't know if they'd be directly correlated or you know and certainly maybe not causal though they though they could be um but but i think it would all i, I think it would also speak to the to the, to the overall health of um the the political representation in the community um and and if and if you on the one hand you you have a lot of um goals for inclusivity and but then on the other hand representation is really sort of um doled out unequally um you you can I think I think that doesn't mean you you wouldn't hope that the representation couldn't do the same job or be just as effective, um, but it, but it would give you something to look at and 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 maybe do a little bit of a, a bit of a gut check, um, you know. So certainly on our like state representation level that you're talking about, you know that that sounds real that sounds very representative and 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 I think you're right about it. Um, but we also have correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I remember you know. Our multiple layers of government, you know, we end up with with hundreds of elected officials. Yeah. In in you know maybe in our in just our region, if if you went if you added up the um, uh, the council people in the village, yeah, uh, the village, village towns, all yeah. of them. there's there's a lot a lot of seats out there, a lot of elected representatives. Yeah. So you could do analysis on that, and I don't think we we ever really have looked that over, and and so maybe you you find out that in our um, uh, state delegation, we, you know, we, we've succeeded, um, and, and there's the good equal representation there. But then if we look at all of, all of the region and we look at all of this political representation, which as you know, has, has a tremendous amount of influence and power. Um, what is, what does that look like? And, and do we, you know, can, can we understand how, how well, um, inequality or how well equality is playing out by, by looking at it on, on those political bounds. Yeah. I don't so, know. That's why I'm asking the smart kids at Maxwell to do all the work. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. So when you, when you show some of that, um, do you have any, um, so I know you're looking at changing indicators and, or, or looking at new indicators to measure the, um, you know, the equity of the economic growth and, and, but do we have of, of the positive data analysis that you have from last year, um, has there been any of those indicators? Like, for example, seeing those charts about job growth in Syracuse, 
Do we know, um, you know, gender, race, um, wealth, uh, those different uh, indicators? Do we have any um, data on that as of yet, or is that something you're developing now? I think that's a, that's something that we're developing now, um, and and that data is available. Um, it, it's it's a it's a matter of um, really. I think I, I think part of it is that, that what what I've learned so far is that it, it, it's a multi-stakeholder process that should play out over, over a, a, a series of engagements. So, you know, that's different from me, um, you know, doing my own, doing my own homework and, and coming up with, with questions like yours, which are great, and then sort of deciding that this would be important to, to look at. We can do some of that, but a better process that we want to engage in is how do we talk with a lot of people in the community like yourself who ask those same kinds of questions and then and then come to a really broadly engaged understanding of of what we will make an effort to to track and and you know keep score on so um so yeah it's, it's out there and 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 we've looked at some of it but we're we're currently in the process of doing the best we can to um understand as a community what we want to monitor so in your uh, in your experience, when we talk about elected representatives, we talk about officials. Um, you know, it's always kind of a marriage of um, you know politics and economics. Um, what do you think are some you know some best practices? What can what can local governments do to be a good partner to economic growth? And and you know any any you know obviously those are pretty large questions that have very nuanced, complex answers, but any thoughts off the top of your head that, that, um, you know, that, that you, um, like to say, you, you know, best practices or something that seems simple that you don't see happening, uh, often in, in local governments or, you know, any, you know, insights into that. There's, there's always a, there, I mean, for, so for, for all local governments, there's a revenue challenge. Um, and, and that's always going to be in tension with um, uh, business attraction and, and because the revenues have to be there. So how can, how can local governments save costs for businesses that don't come out of their own revenues? Um, and, and I think some of that has to do with uh, permitting processes and, and making um, business decisions um, a little more transparent so that uh, people who want to do business in, in a region can understand more clearly up front uh, what the policies and procedures are so that they can make their own cost decisions. That saves them money and time. And then if your local government is constrained by, by a revenue challenge, you, um, they can balance that out and, and you can get a business. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is, um, is workforce. If you go through a lot of the economic development uh, literature, um, decisions on really where to be have a lot to do with workforce. Obviously, you can't really run a business if you don't have people who can work for it. And, um, and this is this is definitely my own opinion. Actually, all of this is my own opinion. Uh, <laughs> but uh, education is 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 the uh, the in my opinion, is the purest economic development program um, out there. Uh, you can't do any of this if if you have an uneducated and illiterate population. Um, it, it, that's that's a skill level that we expect to to be present and forget that it's a public service uh, that we provide this um, educated, literate, uh, w well-trained workforce with a high school education um, and investments in education and workforce uh, are have great returns as well. So if you invest in, in early childhood education or any sort of programs um, early on, you get returns from all of that for a number of reasons. One is because you make the population more productive. And the other thing is, is you, you discourage uh, behaviors that are damaging and costly. So you have less crime and you have less need for social services. So my own opinion is, is, is I, and my wife's a teacher, so obviously that's another reason that I'm biased, but um, you can't, yeah, I, I, you, I don't think you can put too much into education. And if yeah, you're talking my, about 
Economics. My wife is a teacher, and my wife and my mother are both teachers, so I, I share your opinion. But it's it was interesting to hear you talk about economy and have uh, education come out as you know one of your uh, you know I believe you said to me that other you know infrastructure and other things might not be invested in and and um, you know they're not necessarily not necessarily uh, you know deal breakers or game enders, but not investing in education is you know, foundational to, to economic growth. And while I was reading, um, I, I'm in the process right now of reading uh, Capital by Thomas Piketty. And oh, good. He, yeah, he keeps he You're keeps, ahead of me. Oh, yeah? Have you not, you not tucked into that one? Yeah, I just listened to his podcast interview, so I got to do the real work. Tell, oh, me what you're tell me what you're learning. That's Yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's super interesting stuff. But he, he basically says the same thing, you know, the, the two biggest thing, you know, the biggest issue of, um, you know, if we look back at the times that uh, we reflect on, um, I don't know how to say it, wh where, where kind of the American mythology of being able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and we could have a more nuanced conversation about all the people that got left out of that, um, you know, that, that pull yourself up by your bootstraps, American dream meritocracy kind of thing. But where those, where that mythology and those dreams were most alive is, you know, um, in in the for you know post World War II era uh, 50s 60s when you know taxes were high and um, you know uh, the, the the income inequality was at its lowest, um, but and a lot education of education was a huge investment. Exactly, and and you know that's where I was coming back around with that was you know the the investments in education, and so while we see the two biggest things are are you know income inequality and education and, and, you know, the direct correlation between those two. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's, um, you know, I, I appreciate you, you, you focusing so much on education when you speak about the economy, because um, it, it's, it's becoming more, it wasn't something that I thought of until you, you know, you started bringing it up to me and reading more. I mean, obviously it's something I thought of, but you know, you reemphasizing that key connection has, has been something that's really sparked a lot of new thought, you know, to me yeah. as well. And, I, and that goes to, to, to an earlier question you had about, um, you know, local governments and what and what can we do? Um, and again, Syracuse has, has been on a terrific path. Um, the, the STEAM school is, you know, exactly what, what this is about. Um, and, and that, and that's still, that's the direction we're going. So I, so I think that's, that's a really promising sign. And, and unless my logic is, is off, which it frequently is, um, but I don't know if it is here, um, you need infrastructure for business. Um, that's for sure. But um, you, could, you could say that some business forms up even without certain levels of, of infrastructure, um, though I think infrastructure is really important. Um, and th there's, a, there's other things that go, a lot of things that go in economic development. But I, but I would say the logic is that nothing happens if you don't have education, um, right. build a bunch of roads, build a build a technology park. If you have no educated workforce that can that can competently function to do anything, then then it doesn't matter how much of that you have. So I just put it at the top of the the hierarchy, and um, I'm I'm happy to be proven wrong about that if that's the case. But I I just think it's 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 a place of that keeps coming up, and and I think. Piketty almost also brought in um, the research and development spending in this country, and mm -hmm. um, it, the the returns there ha are tremendous as well. Um, if if you took even just one thing like the Human Genome Project, um, and in the the relatively small investment that the government made into that, and then the um, the billions or maybe trillions of dollars that have resulted from from the private industry that's come out of that, yeah, um, those those are great those are great things that that benefit everybody, and I I like those programs that uh, generally have a major return and improve people's lives. And yeah, well, so we didn't get a lot of questions beforehand um, from folks on on social, but I'm seeing a few in the comments now, Darren. Uh, so I'll, I'll just show you a few things for us to discuss that we're seeing in the comment section of of the live stream now. Um, from Darren, any opinion on financing opportunities uh, post COVID for new businesses? Um, what's, you know, where would you see new opportunities 
uh, when this ends. And for me, I, I guess, you know, the first thing that comes to my head with all, um, it's just been, it's really been anxiety inducing for me because we just, you know, everyone's waiting for the COVID crisis to pass. And it's really hard to make predictions until we know what the shape of it is. I don't think, you know, it's like a pool that we haven't, uh, our, our feet haven't hit the bottom yet. Like we don't know when, you know, until a vaccine comes or till something, you know, massive shifts, it's hard to know when this is going to end and what it is. But I, you know, not to uh, discount the question, any thoughts on what would be a new financing opportunity post COVID new businesses? I, I don't, I don't really know if, if, um, like at the federal level, if any any programs, financing programs are are on you know in the works. Um, it, unfortunately, it seems like things at, at that level have quickly gone back to a pretty um, partisan and uh, divided uh, nature. But at the again at the community level and and more community financing um, operations or CDFI. Um, Capacity community financing development institutes. Um, if if they are if they have more capacity to lend um, and get more capital at the local level, I, I think we'll do better. And um, I've seen some momentum in that direction. Um, yeah, yeah. So ho hopefully that continues. Do you uh, do you have any? What do you know about that, Joe? Yeah, I mean we passed we passed a um, a resolution uh, requesting that you know we be allowed to work with more local institutions and that you know funding go through that. I think you know. I think that's it. I think you see, you know, um, lending institutions with more closer grassroots ties to, you know, local people and, and relationships, kind of like what Alameen said, you know, about, yeah. um, you know, those those kind of things. So I, I think that, um, you know, I concur that I think that would be a great development if we if we started moving more in that direction. It, it, am I understanding your your uh, your question correctly there, or your your thought process? Yeah, I, I think it's it. it you know, it has a lot to do with access, and I've already and I have seen some proposals of um, also dealing with the uh, challenge of of unbanked populations. Yeah, you know, we we all had these stimulus checks came out direct deposit, and that doesn't really help anyone. Who does, and, and we realize that a lot of people don't have bank accounts. Yeah, um, and if and if and if you're going to end up one day uh, borrowing money to start a business. Um, that path begins with you having a bank account to begin with. If if you don't have a bank account and you and you stay unbanked for for quite a long time and 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 uncredited, um, the opportunities that may come up and arise, you're you're not in you're not in the system. Um, yeah. And and I think there's I think there's been some federal uh, policy proposals that include subsidizing bank accounts. Yeah. Um, to me that and that's. That that's a great issue. Like that, that's an equality issue. That's something that we can. That's very affordable at a federal level, and that would have a broad benefit. Yeah. So um, I, I'm seeing a comment here from Gina. Um, when you were showing, I'm assuming this is from when you were showing the graphs of of job growth. She's saying, uh, you know, what jobs and for whom. I think we touched on that a little bit. Um, but so many of these jobs are taken by people who live outside the city. Um, have you seen any data on that? I, I think that's, you know, that's a constant, you know, for, for, for example, the city of Syracuse, you know, we've, the conversation is always ongoing about residency requirements and people living with inside the city. So for that job growth, do you, is that, are you seeing any data on, um, are those jobs being taken by people who live within the city limits or are they jobs that are just created within the city or is this more of an Onondaga County thing? So um, yeah, just just to be clear, I, I I forgot to make this part of it clear. So when it when it says Syracuse and then it has the other places, um, it, it's it's for the Syracuse metro area. So that's Onondaga, Oswego, and Madison County combined. Okay. Um, so there's job growth for, for for those three counties. A lot of that job growth, um, we could look at specific. I think we could look get down to the county level. Um, there's a great research tool, and, and I think Joe, we are going to talk about this as well. That there's a lot of great tools out there for, that that are really accessible, so we can we can look this stuff up and and uh, you know get past news headlines and and even get past like charts that I share. And, and maybe there's you know there's better questions. So you can look at where um, jobs are, like 
where people live and, and where they commute to uh, for their jobs. So um, I'd, ha I'd be happy to follow up on any of those questions. Um, and, yeah, maybe and, hop into the comments and, and, and direct people to some resources. Are there resources you'd like to to name off the top? I know you mentioned a, you mentioned a few to me when we were talking about yeah. um, about you know tracking economic activity. Is are, are there some easy trackers that people who are uh, nerding out that want to do their own research that you could just name off the top? Yeah, I could give you my my favorite of the favorite of the week or the month or whatever. Um, the economic tracker. Um, you want to show my screen again? Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is good stuff. Um, so th this is a uh, this is updated on a weekly basis. Um, it's as far as I know, um, one of the best high frequency data sources during the crisis here. Um, so it gets frequent updates. We can go to the county level on a lot of things. Um, so this chart shows us um, what happened uh, in terms of uh, employees, percentage change at small businesses. And it's nicely labeled. I don't know if you can see my pointer um, to see what, you know, these key dates of when schools closed, stay at home orders um, and, uh, and then stimulus payments. So I'm going to show you one other chart on the same cons on the same scale for Onondaga County. If we ever load it and is that it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So this is, this is a really helpful chart. You can see this is consumer spending. Uh huh. So you can see, uh, again, here's pre COVID-19, um, stay at home orders, schools close, and then you see stimulus payments give us a bump. Uh huh. Um, and then the question is going to be, I think for the next step is we're, we're having a uh, phase one ease, easing restrictions. So we're going to watch all right here. We have select businesses open. So we're going to watch, um, does the spend consumer spending start to grow? I, I think we expect it will, we hope it will. And then, um, uh, track it from there. So this is another great tool, uh, tracktherecovery.org um, to look across the country. I'm still curious about Oswego. I, I've been looking for answers here. Yeah, because you said they, they're they bumped up to like pre-COVID times already. Like they're, they're and what, what are, what is all this? Is, this is this is measuring consumer spending. So this is like shops, restaurants, right? That's the economic yeah. movement that it's tracking. Yes. Yeah. I guess maybe just a lot of people in Oswego can't cook, <laughs> so they they must be just ordering takeout for every. I don't know how is that possible that during these shutdowns they're seeing this. Um, you know, obviously they do. You do see a dip there once stay at home comes, but. They seem to have bounced back up so majorly. Yeah, um, m maybe uh, compared. I didn't look at this, but it, but if they have a if their retail because we know retail got hit probably the hardest, and that's a lot of consumer spending. If they didn't have a major retail um, uh, business anyway, maybe there was less to, to have directly impacted right away. Um, but but I don't know, or 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 perhaps. The distancing measures were, you know, they were able to um, do more curbside for the types of uh, consumption that they that they had. Um, I don't know. It's interesting to watch. I, I actually just updated. Last I saw this, it was they were up three percent from pre-COVID. Um, so it's gone up since then, um, and continues to be one of only two counties in the state. Um, huh. So yeah, we keep track of this and uh, get get to some more uh, clues about about the recovery. Um, New York State Department of Labor employment that we can follow. Um, another thing that I that I mentioned was uh, a, a habit that I've developed that I think is a good one is when you read um, an article in the in the news or any sort of place and it tells you that a study says something and usually it's very um, from dictated to you, studies tell us, and 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 then we know whether to be terrified or 
um, have no concerns or whatever it is. Um, always click on the study. Usually there's a link to it. Um, and then read the study, uh, read the abstract. Um, sometimes you'll find that the, the study actually isn't saying that at all. Um, yeah. Or it's saying something that sort of indicates that, but more subtle. So just always go back to those sources. Um, with the resources we have, uh, you know, it's it's an amazing time to to really get informed. And then, of course, the the irony is that we're overloaded with with information and news and stories, and it's really hard to uh, sift through it all. But I think actually, if if you if you go past all that and do some of your own reading, sometimes you get to clarity. Other, other times you don't. But um, yeah. You done with the screens here? Yeah, I'm done with that one. Okay, it's a nice one. Pop back in. That was very interesting, man. Oh, actually, let me share one more. Okay. Yeah, because this this was my favorite. I'm just mostly excited that I got that I'm I'm the guy sharing screens. Like I, I feel so. <laughs> Is this I, the first screen sharing? The first yeah. screen sharing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. All right. Right here. Well, then um, we'll end with we'll end it with my one of my favorite data visualizations. Yeah. So we were talking about industries in Syracuse. Yep. And um, and this is a great way to visualize. Uh, so and this is uh, GDP. So this is like actual uh, output from those industries. Um, and these are uh, these are expressed in dollars. So that's uh, this is this is four billion, and and manufacturing's at uh, three point four billion. And then you can watch it change. So you see manufacturing in Syracuse, uh, long our leading industry. Yeah, wow. And you'll see um, professional services and utilities uh, start to move into, into, into those positions. Wow. So we can st and we'll stop at 2018. Yeah, yeah, stop at 2018. So, what's red? What's purple? What's what's blue there at the top three? Uh, sorry, you can't see uh, real estate and rental and leasing. Okay. And then professional and business services and utilities is blue, and manufacturing is green. Wow. So, so if you watch manufacturing, um, you know it's it's also encouraging that. Um, you know, it's it's still hanging, still hanging in there, and, and and we have a lot of good reasons to continue uh, to invest in that. Of course, manufacturing all over the country changed dramatically um, after two thousand eight, um, but but it's it's among our top industries with uh, uh, utilities as well. So, yeah, any um, you good you good with that one? Yeah. Wow, that's that's a great graph, and um. So like, I, where do you think, so it was really funny. I was having a, a conversation with my siblings today about, you know, um, manufacturing. That's an American story, right? Like, you know, I, I always think of the wire, you know, I'll probably now on this podcast, I think this is the third episode in a row where I've referenced the wire at some point, uh, in the episode of my favorite show, but there's one scene where there, where, uh, the two guys are sitting there in, in the in the harbor in in, uh, in Baltimore, and he looks at the old rundown plant. He's like, "They used to make steel there, no?" And it's just the most subtle nod to like, "Yeah, remember remember the city? Like they used to we used to make things here, you know." And it's yeah. it's kind of a, a not so subtle commentary about um, you know where we are. And I, and every time you hear people talking about the Syracuse economy. Uh, you can't get 30 seconds into the conversation where someone brings up carrier and carrier leaving. Um, yes. Any any thoughts on that? Like, are we, um, you know, my kind of, I, I guess I'm in two minds about it, you know. Um, like you said, it, it's obviously an important indicator, an important industry that we need to keep investing in. But should we also be, you know, to what extent should we be looking at what the next manufacturing is or or you know how do we how do we compete with manufacturing with what's going on with globalization with like the change in the market you know yeah you know there's some changes I expect in in uh, globalization and particularly uh, global supply chains I think we could probably expect to see some of that reshored um, 
and Syracuse may benefit may benefit from from that from from having industries for that. But I, I think the other place to 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 really get optimistic and and really feel uh, good about our industries and Syracuse in general is uh, our innovative history and also our potential for in innovation continuing. And 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 I think I was, when I was talking about some of the great investments that have been made in our in our regional economy, uh, particularly as it pertains to um, uh, the drone corridor, the unmanned aerial systems, and I mean the, the tech garden is is an incredible success. Um, you know this is one of the largest uh, tech incubators um, in in the region. The competition is has just exploded in terms of interest and applications to do the genius um, uh, event um, and, and get awarded. And those tech startups have to stay in this region. Um, but so, so for your your thing about the wire, and you know, um, I have a I have a really harder story, like a tough, like a gut punch. Um, so this is about a year ago. I was uh, I just started at I just started doing this work. I'd only been doing it for a few months, and I was very enthusiastic to 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 be on the boosterism aspect of this. So I was in um, I was in Oakville, uh, Oakville, Ontario, mm -hmm. and I walked into I had to buy some socks. Or something stupid like that, and uh, and I'm walking through, and there's a Brannock device on the wall. Do you know about the Brannock device? No. That's the that's the metal thing that measures your feet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Invented Syracuse. invented in Syracuse. Yep. And yep. it'll say, I think it says on it, Brannock device patented in Syracuse, New York, whatever. So all right, so I'm up there. I'm this big Syracuse booster, and I walk in and I point it at, at the wall while this guy's getting me some incredibly expensive socks. <laughs> um, and, uh, I said, do you know what that is? And I was really excited. And he goes, history. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use that thing anymore. I was like, I was about to tell you how great Syracuse is, but yeah, yeah. A little shot, little shot to the ribs as you're about to bring out your, uh, your fabulous story. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, but, but the innovation, um, I had no response. I still don't really have a response to that one. I guess I told someone told me they use it all the time. But um, the in innovation that that drove um, uh, a lot of industries in Syracuse. Um, if you go back, there was a time when when Syracuse was really uh, several times actually when Syracuse was one of the leading um, industrial innovators. Um, those investments have been made recently, and and there a lot of them are coming to fruition. And then another really exciting point that, I, that I'm on about is um, a book came out about a year ago or more called Jumpstarting America. Mm. And this sort of goes into what Piketty was saying about um, education and research investment. Um, they identified Syracuse as, uh, I forget if it was second or third in the nation as the best place where research and development investment on a national scale would pay off. And, and that's owing to our high concentration of college graduates, our uh, university systems, um, our physical location, our geography. Um, so uh, there's a lot of promise there. And, and, and I think if, if on a higher policy level that we're back to investing in research, development, and education, um, Syracuse is, is, again, in the same, in a great place to, to lead all that. And it's already been, it's recognized. Um, uh, across the country, actually. Great. Uh, I'll, I'll send you that book when you get through the Piketty, which is, I think, it, he just wrote another book. I think his next book is like a thousand pages or something. I don't. Yeah, maybe you could um, mail it to me for 2024 when I finally finish Capital. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I have problem, I have problem sleeping, so I, you know, I, I I wake up at like four and I start. I read yeah? hours before I start the day. Uh, um, well, the Econ Books podcast is really good. You can. They talk all about the books, and then and then you get done after read as much. Cool. I like I said, it helps me get to sleep. Now, um, <laughs> so I got a question here from Bob Andrews. Don't you think that there needs to be direct capital infusions that aren't just loans? Um, loans for small businesses will be a burden to growth, and that's a lot of what we've been talking about throughout COVID. You know, a lot of these podcasts we've had people chiming in, and a lot of people have said, you know, like for example, a lot of the lending institutions are saying. Yeah, we're we're waiving it, but at the end of six months, you'll you'll have to pay them, make the payments in full, and it's it's like, yeah, well, if I'm not working for those three or four months, like, how do you expect me to have 
you know, show up in six months with all the money that I'm supposed to be paying. So, um, and, and, you know, I had some small business owners, uh, chime in saying, saying the same thing Bob's saying about, you know, what do you think about, you know, not loans, but actual infusions? Um, I, I don't, I don't really, I don't think I have enough, uh, expertise on that specifically, but I mean, the PPP program is, I think it's pretty clear that that's not going to solve um, all of the problems that we needed to solve or that we thought it was going to solve. But but certainly, um, yeah, having capital, patient capital available um, is a huge need. And, and that's why we, you know, things like um, the tech garden uh, do their best to, to, to find capital and find investors. Um, and we didn't bring up opportunity zones. Um, and, mm. and that yep. is something that sort of got sidelined, um, but we're still focused on it. If you're in an opportunity zone and, and most of the city of Syracuse is an opportunity zone, um, you can attract capital investment uh, that um, comes with tremendous tax advantages. Yeah, so perhaps explain, you know, I know what the um, opportunity zones, but maybe explain to the folks who, who aren't familiar with the concept what it, what they, what it means to be in an opportunity zone. So if you're in a uh, if you're in a zone if you have a business or a property that's in a zone, um, and and you uh, have uh, and you can take an equity stake or you can sell an equity stake or someone can put capital in, if that capital came from the sale of stock or property that was subject to capital gains taxes, um, you get you get tremendous tax advantage status. Um, the there are reductions in the actual, uh, first of all, there's a delay in, in paying those taxes um, of several years. There's a reduction in how much tax is actually owed. So your tax bill goes down. And, and then the most attractive feature is that that capital that was invested um, grows, if it grows, um, tax-free. So mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you have a business in an opportunity zone in Syracuse and you attract cap you can attract capital more easily uh, from an investor who wants to put it in there for 10 years or more they will get tax benefits to incentivize that capital um, and then whatever appreciates from their investment is tax free and and that i think addresses what bob is saying is that yes capital is needed um the opportunity zone program was was one program to address that but i think um, more programs will be will be needed, whether or not they're they're grants or just um, ways of incentivizing investment. Mm. Uh, Kevin Schwab says, Joe Jared just can't help himself with all these graphs. Be careful, <laughs> or, or you will be sucked into his eternal vortex as well. He said, Oh my gosh, now the graphs are moving. Jared has superpowers. <laughs> so. So this, the thing is, Kevin knows what's going on here. He knows <laughs> that he knows that we have several meetings. Uh, usually, I show up with graphs. Usually, Kevin says, uh, "These are your pets. These are your pet projects. We don't need <laughs> this." And and so he knows what's going on. Is that I I found it's like my it's like my kid. Um, yeah. I found someone who will talk to me. And <laughs> Good stuff. Well, all right, brother. I think, you know, we've been trying to keep these to roughly an hour. We're about an hour and eight minutes now. Um, it's been absolutely uh, wonderful having you on. And, and really, uh, is there anything you want to say to folks? You know, one thing that you've, um, you know, you've been very uh, interactive with some of the podcasts, soliciting feedback from people. Is there anything you want to, um, you know, I remember, you, you, for example, the other day you asked Alameen about, possible indicators we should be looking at. Are you looking for feedback from anyone or anything you'd like to, um, you know, I allow people to plug whatever they're doing or put any requests to folks that might still be watching? Yeah, always um, feedback. Um, I, I don't have any specific re re requests because it'll, um, but one thing that you and I talked about is that um, it's really important that that people continue to see what you know what public servants are doing and that's why i really like that you're doing this i like um the interview with pam was great and um all of the other interviews um be, because it's it's a really crucial thing that you know going back to the beginning when i was talking about uh being fairly cynical about um what public service is and what politicians are um just just keep staying engaged um 
keep recognizing that the public public servants, most most of them, um, the the vast majority, are conscientious, thoughtful, dedicated people doing their best to learn. Um, gather a lot. The, I, I think Obama had a thing on his desk that said, "Hard questions are hard, or the hard things are hard." Yeah. Um, and 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 it is hard work. And and um, so and I want to be. So my only request would be, I want to be as helpful as I can be um, to learn more. Um, I'm just on the very start of this learning curve. So um, any questions or feedback, um, can you provide my email address? Yeah, for sure. Do you want me to put it in, in uh, the description or in the – or you can read it out if you want or, or say it. Or I yeah. Can... Uh, they, um, I'll, I'll, can I type it here? Yeah, just put it in the comments if, if folks want to. Right. And I'll, I'll put it in the description of the event as well. Uh, when we post the podcast, if folks want to reach out to you, people can yeah. find you pretty easily if they Google you, uh, Jared Shepard, with uh, currently with Center State CEO. Yeah, uh, you can use my personal email address or email me there. Um, I, I've I've been happy to pick up the phone, and I get I'll get phone calls from people in the community who, who have a, just like a general research question, like um, what's going on with you know this building or or this park or something like that. I don't always know, but um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to respond to any of that. So questions about anything that um, we're talking about or, or what we need to know, um, that's how I can learn. Yeah, I think I think it's, it's really interesting, the new pursuit that you're exploring about, um, you know, because that's, you know, I think you and I both talked about doing public meetings, community meetings with folks or, or business meetings with small groups. And whenever you talk about um, economic success in Syracuse or economic growth, um, the the immediate response is, "What do you mean by economic growth? And who is benefiting? And and those kind of things." So I think it's really, um, you know, really important uh, pursuit that you're undertaking now to see what are the economic indicators that show inclusivity, that show equity. You know, I think that's. Uh, and, and it's great that we've been having this this open conversation in Syracuse for the last few years. You know, since since I've uh, you know been more engaged. You know, I, I was living abroad for a number of years, and as soon as I came back to Syracuse, got engaged in the political scene, and and uh, it feels like there's been very open and robust conversations about you know having hard conversations about um, you know what does an inclusive economy look like, what does an equitable economy look like. Um, but we're we're very while well, while it's great to have conversations, we're still very far from knowing what that looks like, having a roadmap, or you know, knowing if we're actually getting closer, if we're getting there. And that to me is is such a big thing when we say you know Syracuse went from you know Alamine had the stat that Syracuse used to be number eight uh, for impoverished cities, and now we're number thirteen, and we we've moved down five mm -hmm. spots from the data he'd been looking at. And, yeah. Um, you know, that's a good, that's a good sign, but, uh, I mean, you know, I'm not going to throw a party or anything, but, um, you know, it's still, still not great, but, um, you know, what does that growth look like? What caused, what caused that drop? You know, how do we, how do we get that benefit of going down five places and all those kind of questions about, um, you know, the conversations have been happening, but what does the roadmap look like to get us to, a more inclusive economy, a more more equitable economy. I think it's a, it's a important questions that you're asking, and I think you know I, I feel confident that with your uh, skills in in data collection and analysis, that, that you'll come with some very interesting stuff. So I'd love to have you back when you you know get further down the road with it as well. Yeah, great. Yeah, and 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 thank you. You're what you're describing. It's it is the hard work is is hard for a reason, but I think the really good news is that. Um, uh, it, it works that hard hard work ends up being the only way of course um, not every community does this um, and, and improvements that we see aren't just uh, coincidences um, and and it's so it's a good sign to, to talk to people like you and, and find this large community of people who we find out every day are saying I'm doing really hard work um, <laughs> trying to figure this out um, that's great because that doesn't happen that's not happening everywhere yeah. So last comment, Bob Andrews said it'd be good if you monitor rents and mortgage payments as we emerge from COVID. Uh, if they decline, it'll have an impact on banks ultimately. 
So that was that was an interesting thought before we leave. All so right, I got my pen out. Nice. <laughs> got it down. Well, sorry, we're about an hour 15, brother. Okay. I'll, I'll probably chip off now. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to talk to me and as well for all the, you know, like you said, the hard work is hard and I appreciate you, uh, you know, doing all of it and, and reaching out and um, and your uh, online concerts have been a lot of fun too. <laughs> Not as good as yours. Ah, well, you know, no, I, I wouldn't say that. You're definitely a, a more proficient musician. I'll, I'll say that, but what's the difference between a, um, a jazz musician and a pop musician? You know that one? No, but I'm, I'm curious. I like this. Um, a jazz musician plays 5,000 chords for three people <laughs> and, and a pop musician plays three chords for 5,000 people. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I got GC and D down. I got those three. I'm working them. It's going well. I, clearly, that's uh, Mozart didn't get too far beyond. Yeah, you know, he used seven at the most. I yeah, think. that's all you need. Just yeah. six or seven chords. You're golden. <laughs> all but right. anyway, you're you're doing great stuff, brother. Both musically, uh, economically, and in policy research, we we really appreciate your uh, contributions to the local community. And we look forward to having you back again soon. And, and I look forward to hearing what your uh, your data yields as far as what an uh, inclusive economy looks like in Syracuse. So, that sounds good. Sounds like I got an assignment. I like it. <laughs> All right, brother. Thanks, Joe. Take care, brother. Thank you, you too.